पेज नंबर सेवेंटी थ्री नाउ द सेकेंड पार्ट ऑफ द सेम चैप्टर द हंड्रेड ड्रेसेस पार्ट टू लेसन सिक्स द स्टोरी बाय एल बसोर एस्टर वाइल द क्लास वॉज सर्कलिंग द रूम द मॉनिटर फ्रॉम द प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफिस ब्रॉट मिस मेजन अ नोट मिस मेजन रेड इट सेवरल टाइम्स एंड स्टडीड इट थॉटफुली फॉर ए वाइल देन शी क्लैप हर हैंड्स अटेंशन क्लास एवरी ऑन बैक टू देयर सीट वेन द शफलिंग ऑफ फीट हैड स्टॉप्ड एंड द रूम वॉज स्टिल एंड क्वाइट मिस मेजन सेड I have a letter from Vanda's father that I want to read to you. Miss Mason stood there a moment and the silence in the room grew tense and expectant. The teacher adjusted her glasses slowly and deliberately. Her manner indicated that what was coming. This letter from Vanda's father was a matter of great importance. Everybody listened closely as Miss Mason read the brief note. Dear teacher my vanda will not come to your school any more jake also now we move away to big city no more holer polack no more ask why funny names plenty of funny names in the big city yours truly jan petronsky a deep silence met the reading of this letter miss mason took off her glasses blew on them and wiped them on her soft white handkerchief then she put them on again and looked at the class when she spoke her voice was very low i am sure that none of the boys and girls in room 13 would purposely and deliberately hurt anyone's feelings because his or her name happened to be a long unfamiliar one page number 74 I prefer to think that what was said was said in thoughtlessness. I know that all of you feel the way I do that this is a very unfortunate thing to have happened, unfortunate and sad both. And I want you all to think about it. The first period was a study period. Maddie tried to prepare her lessons, but she could not put her mind on her work. she had a very sick feeling in the bottom of her stomach true she had not enjoyed listening to peggy ask vanda how many dresses she had in her closet but she had said nothing she had stood by silently and that was just as bad as what peggy had done worse she was a coward at least peggy hadn't considered they were being mean but she maddy had thought they were doing wrong she could put herself in vanda's shoes goodness wasn't there anything she could do if only she could tell vanda she hadn't meant to hurt her feelings she turned around and stole a glance at peggy but peggy didn't look up she seemed to be studying hard well whether peggy felt badly or not she Maddy had to do something. She had to find Vanda Petronsky. Maybe she had not yet moved away. Maybe Peggy would climb the heights with her, and they would tell Vanda she had won the contest. That they thought she was smart, and the hundred dresses were beautiful. Oral comprehension check number one. What did Mr. Petronsky's letter say? Number two. Is Miss Mason angry with the class? or she is unhappy and upset number 3 how does maddy feel after listening to the note from vanda's father number 4 what does maddy want to do page number 75 when school was dismissed in the afternoon peggy said with pretended casualness hey let's go and see if that kid has left town or not So Peggy had had the same idea. Maddy glowed. Peg was really all right. The two girls hurried out of the building, up the street toward Boggins Heights. 
the part of town that wore such a forbidding air on this kind of a November afternoon, drizzly, damp and dismal. Well, at least, said Becky gruffly, I never did call her a foreigner or make fun of her name. I never thought she had the sense to know we were making fun of her anyway. I thought she was too dumb and gee, look how she can draw. Mary could say nothing. All she hoped was that they would find Vanda. She wanted to tell her that they were sorry they had picked on her and how wonderful the whole school thought she was and please not to move away and everybody would be nice. She and Peggy would fight anybody who was not nice. The two girls hurried on. They hoped to get to the top of the hill before dark. I think that's where the Petronskys live, said Maddie, pointing to a little white house. Wisps of old grass stuck up here and there along the pathway like thin kittens. The house and its sparse little yard looked shabby but clean. It reminded Maddie of Vanda's one dress, her faded blue cotton dress, shabby but clean. There was not a sign of life about the house. Peggy knocked firmly on the door, but there was no answer. She and Mary went around to the backyard and knocked there. Still there was no answer. Page number 76 There's no doubt about it. The Petronskys were gone. How could they ever make amends? They turned slowly and made their way back down the hill. Well, anyway, said Peggy, she's gone now, so what can we do? Besides, when I was asking her about all her dresses, she probably was getting good ideas for her drawings. She might not even have won the contest otherwise. Maddie turned this idea carefully over in her head, for if there were anything in it, she would not have to feel so badly. But that night she could not get to sleep. She thought about Vanda and her faded blue dress and the little house she had lived in. And she thought of glowing picture those hundred dresses made all lined up in the classroom. At last Maddie sat up in bed and pressed her forehead tight in her hands and really thought. This was the hardest thinking she had ever done. After a long, long time, she reached an important conclusion. She was never going to stand by and say nothing again. If she ever heard anybody picking on someone because they were funny looking or because they had strange names, she would speak up. Even if it meant losing Peggy's friendship, she had no way of making things right with Vanda. But from now on, she would never make anybody else that unhappy again. Oral comprehension check. Number one. What excuses does Peggy think up for her behavior and why? Number two. What are Maddie's thoughts as they go to Boggins Heights? Number three. Why does Vanda's house remind Maddie of Vanda's blue dress? Page 77. Number four. What does Maddie think hard about? What important decision does she come to? Now the story further. On Saturday, Maddie spent the afternoon with Peggy. They were writing a letter to Vanda Petronsky. It was just a friendly letter telling about the contest and telling Vanda she had won. They told her how pretty her drawings were and they asked her if she liked where she was living and if she liked her new teacher. They had meant to say they were sorry, but it ended up with their just writing a friendly letter, the kind they would have written to any good friend, and they signed it with lots of X's for love. They mailed the letter to Boggins Heights, writing please forward on the envelope. Days passed 
and there was no answer. But the letter did not come back. So maybe Vanda had received it. Perhaps she was so hurt and angry she was not going to answer. You could not blame her. Weeks went by and still Vanda did not answer. Peggy had begun to forget the whole business and Maddie put herself to sleep at night making speeches about Vanda, defending her from great crowds of girls who were trying to tease her with, How many dresses have you got? And before Vanda could press her lips together in a tight line, the way she did before answering, Mary would cry out, Stop! Then everybody would feel ashamed, the way she used to feel. Now it was Christmas time, and there was snow on the ground. Christmas bells and a small tree decorated the classroom. On the last day of school, before the holidays, the teacher showed the class a letter she had received that morning. Page number 78 You remember Vanda Petronsky, the gifted little artist who won the drawing contest? Well, she has written me, and I am glad to know where she lives, because now I can send her medal. I want to read her letter to you. The class sat up with a sudden interest and listened intently. Dear Miss Mason, How are you and room 13? Please tell the girls they can keep those hundred dresses because in my new house I have a hundred new ones all lined up in my closet. I'd like that girl Peggy to have the drawing of the green dress with the red trimming and her friend Maddie to have the blue one. For Christmas, I miss that school, and my new teacher does not equalize with you. Merry Christmas to you and everybody. Yours truly, Vanda Petronsky. On the way home from school, Maddie and Peggy held their drawings very carefully. All the houses had reeds, and holly in the windows. Outside the grocery store, hundreds of Christmas trees were stacked, and in the window, candy peppermint sticks and cornucopias of shiny transparent paper were strung. The air smelled like Christmas, and light shining everywhere reflected different colors on the snow. Boy, said Peggy, this shows she really likes us. It shows she got our letter and this is her way of saying that everything is all right. And that's that. I hope so, said Maddie sadly. She felt sad because she knew she would never see the little tight-lipped Polish girl again and couldn't even really make things right between them. She went home and she pinned her drawing over a torn place in the pink-flowered wallpaper in the bedroom. The shabby room came alive with the brilliancy of the colours. Maddie sat down on her bed and looked at the drawing. She had stood by and said nothing, but Vanda had been nice to her anyway. Page 79 Tears blurred her eyes, and she gazed for a long time at the picture. Then hastily, she rubbed her eyes and studied it intently. The colors in the dress were so vivid that she had scarcely noticed the face and head of the drawing. But it looked like her, Maddie. It really looked like her own mouth. Why it really looked like her own self? Vanda had really drawn this for her. Excitedly, she ran over to Peggy's. Peg, she said, let me see your picture. What's the matter? asked Peggy. As they clattered up to her room, where Vanda's drawing was lying, face down on the bed, Maddie carefully raised it. Look! She drew you, 
that's you, she exclaimed. And the head and face of this picture did look like Peggy. What did I say? said Peggy. She must have really liked us anyway. Yes, she must have, agreed Maddie. And she blinked away the tears that came every time she thought of Vanda standing alone in the sunny spot in the schoolyard, looking stolidly over at the group of laughing girls after she had walked off, after she had said, Sure, a hundred of them all lined up. Now oral comprehension check. Number one. What did the girls write to Vanda? Number two, did they get a reply? Who was more anxious for a reply, Peggy or Maddie? How do you know? Number three, how did the girls know that Vanda liked them even though they had teased her? Thinking about the text, number one, why do you think Vanda's family moved to a different city? Do you think life there was going to be different for their family? Number two, Maddie thought her silence was as bad as Peggy's teasing. Was she right? Number three, Peggy says, I never thought she had the sense to know we were making fun of her anyway. I thought she was too dumb and gay. Look how she can draw. What led Peggy to believe that Vanda was dumb? Did she change her opinion later? Page number 80, number 4. What important decision did Maddie make? Why did she have to think hard to do so? Number 5. Why do you think Vanda gave Maddie and Peggy the drawings of the dresses? Why are they surprised? Number 6. Do you think Vanda really thought the girls were teasing her? Why? Or thinking about language. Here are 30 adjectives describing human qualities. Discuss them with your partner and put them in the right two word webs given hereafter according to whether you think they show positive or negative qualities. You can consult a dictionary if you are not sure of the meanings of some of the words. You may also add to the list the positive or negative pair of a given word. The words are kind, sarcastic, courteous, arrogant, insipid, timid, placid, cruel, haughty, proud, zealous, intrepid, sensitive, compassionate, introverted, stolid, cheerful, contented, Thoughtless, vain, friendly, unforgiving, fashionable, generous, talented, lonely, determined, creative, miserable, and complacent. Two webs are given. One web is positive and the other one is negative. The blank spaces are to be filled in with the words which are given just now. Page number 81 Part 2 What adjectives can we use to describe Peggy, Vanda and Maddie? You can choose adjectives from the list which was given earlier. You can also add some of your own. Number 1 Peggy and there is a blank space to describe her with an adjective. Number 2 Vanda and then the blank space for the answer. Number three, Maddie. And the blank space for your answer. Part three. Number one. Find the sentences in the story with the following phrasal verbs. Lined up, thought up, took off, and stood by. Number two. Look up these phrasal verbs in a dictionary to find out if they can be used in some other way. Look at the entries for line, think, take and stand in the dictionary. Find out what other prepositions can go with these verbs. 
What does each of these phrasal verbs mean? Number three, use at least five such phrasal verbs in sentences of your own. Part four, colors are used to describe feelings, moods, and emotions. Match the following color expressions with a suggested paraphrase. Now the color expressions are given first, and then the suggested paraphrases. Number one, the Monday morning blues. Number two, go red in the face. Number three, look green. Number four, the red carpet. Number five, blue blooded. Number six, a green belt. Number seven, a black guard. Number eight, a grey area. Number nine, a white flag. Number ten, a blue print. Number eleven, red handed. Number twelve, the green light. Now the suggested paraphrase. Number one, feel embarrassed, angry, or ashamed. Number two, feel very sick, as if about to vomit. Number three. Sadness or depression after a weekend of fun. Number four, the sign or permission to begin an action. Number five, a sign of surrender or acceptance of defeat. A wish to stop fighting. Number six, in an unlawful act while doing something wrong. Number seven, a photographic print of building plans, a detailed plan or scheme. Number eight, land around town or city where construction is prohibited by law. Number nine, an area of a subject or a situation where matters are not very clear. Number ten, a dishonest person with no sense of right or wrong. Number eleven, a special welcome. Number twelve, of noble birth or from a royal family. Page eighty-two. Speaking, role play. The story of Vanda Petronsky presents many characters engaged in many kinds of behavior: teasing, playing, sitting in class. Form groups. Choose an episode or episodes from the story. Assign roles to each member of the group from that episode and try to act it. And try to act it out like a play, using the words in the story. Writing number one. Look again at the letter which Vanda's father writes to Miss Mason, Vanda's teacher. Mr. Petronsky is not quite aware how to write a formal letter in English. Can you rewrite it more appropriately? Discuss the following with your partner before you do so. The format of formal letter. How to begin the letter and how to end it. The language of the letter needs to be formal. Avoid informal words like "holler" and fragments like "no more ask why funny name." Write complete sentences. Number two, are you interested in drawing and painting? Ritu Kumar, one of India's best-known dress designers, has no formal training in designing. She started by sketching ideas. For her own dresses and getting them stitched by a tailor, Ritu's friends liked her dresses so much that they asked her to design clothes for them, and even paid her for it. Imagine you are going to make a career out of your hobby. What sort of things will you need to learn? Write a paragraph or two on this topic after consulting an expert or doing reference work. On your chosen area, number three, rewrite a part of the story as if Vanda is telling us her own story. In this lesson, what we have done: narrated the story of Vanda Petronsky, a poor little Polish girl in an American school, and how her amazing drawing skills made her classmates feel ashamed about how they had treated her. What you can do. Help your students conduct a survey in their class to find out about the different talents that their classmates possess. Anything from cooking to painting to singing to gardening. Divide the class 
into two equal sections A and B. Each student from section A talks with one student from section B and they interview each other for five or ten minutes so that at the end of that time all the students have been interviewed. Then about five students from each section, more if there is time, talk about the talents of the person they interviewed. Make sure that some of the more marginalized students from your class, each class has some of them, have their moment of fame. This exercise can be done after units 5 and 6 have been completed so that students understand the point of the exercise better. Now the glossary. Page number 73. Listened closely means listened with attention. Page number 75. Damp and dismal means wet and sad. Here expressing a state of hopelessness. Page 76. To make amends means to show that one is sorry by doing something good. Picking on someone means treating someone unkindly, unfairly or by criticizing them. Sorry, once again, picking on someone, treating someone unkindly, unfairly criticizing them. Page 78 Cornucopias means decorative containers usually full of flowers and fruits. Page 83 Animals This is a poem. The poet tells us that he feels more at home with animals than humans whom he finds complicated and false. Now the poem. I think I could turn and live with animals. They are so placid and self-contained. I stand and look at them long and long. They do not sweat and whine about their condition. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. They do not make me sick discussing their duty to God. Not one is dissatisfied, not one is demented with the mania of owning things. Not one kneels to another, nor to his kind that lived thousands of years ago. Not one is respectable or unhappy over the whole earth. So they show their relations to me and I accept them. They bring me tokens of myself they evince them plainly in their position. I wonder where they get those tokens. Did I pass that way huge times ago and negligently drop them? This is a poem by Walt Whitman from his poem Song of Myself in Leaves of Grass. Walt Whitman, who lived between 1819 and 1892, is a major figure in early American poetry. In an age when all poetry was rhymed and metrical, Whitman made a break with tradition and wrote a revolutionary new kind of poetry in free verse. He was a non-conformist in all respects, including his social life. Page 84 Thinking about the poem Number 1 Notice the use of the word turn in the first line. I think I could turn and live with animals. What is the poet turning from? Number two. Mentioned three things that humans do and animals don't. Number three. Do humans kneel to other humans who lived thousands of years ago? Discuss this in groups. Number four. What are the tokens that the poet says he may have dropped long ago and which the animals have kept for him? Discuss this in class. Hint. Whitman belongs to the romantic tradition that includes Rousseau and Wordsworth, 
which holds that civilization has made humans false to their own true nature. What could be the basic aspects of our nature as living beings that humans choose to ignore or deny? English is funny because if the plural of tooth is teeth, why isn't the plural of booth, beath, beath?